Because I don't think hiring another bureaucrat to replace a free citizen gets the job done. Just as in education, if we don't convince the parents to care for their children, and we don't convince the parents to care that their kids learn, it's very hard to substitute for that kind of psychological commitment. Which leads to, I think, some key questions. Are you a citizen? What do you do? How do you live out your citizenship? What is your community? And how do you help renew it? And of course, one of the points I made last week is our community ultimately should be every citizen in this country. Every child is an American child. Every neighborhood is an American neighborhood. And so we have to somehow draw people together. Now, Woodrow Wilson uh, described this in a way that I thought was just tremendous in, and, and, and talked about the notion of, the of, of refugees who come to America having an obligation to live out their new Americanism. And he talked about the idea that, that people who came to America were seeking freedom. And that in that process of seeking freedom, they had an opportunity to continue to expand. So he actually said, in a way, your love of freedom as an immigrant increases our love of freedom because sometimes we've inherited it and we lose some of the spirit of freedom. Similarly, uh, in, in uh, American Civilization, the newspaper this month, on the front page, they, they uh, have a quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, which is just interesting. He, Fitzgerald, who is often a cynic, uh, said the following, and wrote the following in his diaries. He said, America is a willingness of the heart. Now, I want you to just think psychologically about the concept, that, that, it's, that America is about a heart. It's about, it's about a sense that's romantic. In fact, I would argue that citizenship and community are the historic lessons of American civilization that you, 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 you can't uh, understand uh, what America is like unless you look at the wagon train, you look at the pilgrims coming over together in a ship, you look at the barn raising, if you saw, if you saw the movie uh, Witness, a wonderful scene of the Amish raising the barn and realized that was a standard 17th, 18th, 19th century scene in America. That, that uh, in many ways, America is more about the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, uh, Big Brother, Big Sister. It's about people working together more than about the lone individual living in an isolated kind of environment. Ultimately, the essence of community is spiritual, and the essence of citizenship is moral. And I think because for a long period of time, we went through a sort of a secular fetish where people didn't want to delve in and explore this, it's been very hard to communicate. I think I mentioned in here one time that it was reading Gary Will's description of George Washington in uh, his book on, on Inventing America, which is his study of, of the Declaration of Independence. And he says that modern academics find it very hard to understand Washington because he was a spiritual, psychological force, because it was his character that shaped everything. It wasn't his writings. It wasn't his rationality. It was the fact that he was Washington. And I realized also there was a profound insight into all of modern academics, that as it drives out the romantic, as it drives out the, the, the poetry that makes America so remarkable, as it, shrink, as it tries desperately to shrink the founding fathers, and, and in Flexner's new edition of his one-volume biography of Washington, he has an almost bitter section where he talks about the way in which in the modern era there's an effort to reduce Washington to, to, to wooden teeth, uh, and a stiff personality, and that it, it's, an, it's uh, in, in Flexner's mind, it's an assault on the concept of America. Because, in fact, Washington was a very powerful, central organizing figure for 200 years. People said, what is the spirit of freedom? It's Washington giving up the army to go back to Valley Forge, I mean, to go back to Mount Vernon. It's Washington saying his farewell address when he could have won a third term. It's Washington literally dedicating his life to the cause of freedom spending seven years away from home fighting the war. And that people used to know that, and they used to teach it from first grade on. And there was a sense of, this is what it takes to be free. And of course, no, none of us are going to be Washington. But every child can try to be honest. Every child can try to have courage. Every child, child can learn perseverance. Every child can learn the work ethic. And so you have this sense of how do you rebuild and reestablish the spiritual and moral framework. In fact, if you look at uh, two recent books, uh, the Demoralization of Society by Gertrude Himmelfarb and Building a Community of Citizens by Don Eberly, which, as you know, we use here in the course. Both of them begin to make this point 
that our core problem is not government. Our core problem, and so it's not down here in this, in this box four. Our core problem is culture and society. That until we're prepared to have leadership that hammers away at the need to rebuild the spiritual and moral fabric of citizenship, we can't solve it over here with government. Bureaucracy cannot replace culture as a way of organizing a society. And in fact, I would argue that the opposite is true, that the genius of America lies in liberating each citizen to seek community and to define citizenship in the broadest possible way. So take church, synagogue, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Rotary, Kiwanis, Business and Professional Women, the Audubon Society, the Friends of Zoo Atlanta, the Appalachian Trail Club, the Atlanta Law Tennis, uh, the Hash House Harrys. They're all ways of organizing. Anybody here know anything about the Hash House Harrys? No. Some of you do take the class. Do you belong? No, I've read about it. There. I'm not up that kind of my, uh, my younger daughter and her husband uh, have, have run marathons, and there's a group founded in the 1920s in Malaya by British soldiers who would go out on Fridays and they'd carry a, a bag of flour, and they'd send a guy out running, and he would drop it along, uh, the, he'd drop a little flour along through the jungle, and they would chase after it. And after three to five miles, which is their standard route, they'd end up at a bar. And they describe themselves as drinkers with a running problem. <laughs> and so they have, they have, I think there are four clubs in the Atlanta area. It is a, th this is an example of the information age and of Toffler's third wave. They have, I think, they, they have, there's an 800 number. You pay $3 a year. It is a worldwide system of runners. When my, when my daughter and her husband went to London and he ran the marathon, the, the, the Hash House Harriers had a relief station. Uh, part of the way through so you can stop and, and get, get a drink as you're running in the marathon. And then later they found a whole group who were, I think, from uh, the Isle of Wight and they went out with them in the evening. Uh, and they had this common bond. And it is just, it's just this all sorts of unusual people who like to run and who get together and they go do it. Now, my point is, America is about the right of a free people. And we have led the planet in this sense. The government gets out of your face so you can organize your life to do whatever neat thing you like. You like to go spot whales? Go join a club that goes and spots whales. You like to hang glide? Go hang glide. You want to go help people in hospitals? Form a group that goes, and, you know. That, that the genius of the system is to liberate the energy to allow you to do it. And again, let me go back to what, what the pathology of Hollywood doesn't get today. If you see the Hollywood movies, which are in many ways just would be, would I think literally in many ways be seen as sick by any kind of reasonable cycle, you know, uh, you know uh, pulp fiction, and, and natural born killers and, and this kind of thing. Because, because, because they're describing a society which is anomic, in which people are so isolated from each other that they don't have a clue how to live in a common human decent system. And so the, the elite culture of Hollywood doesn't get America. It doesn't understand how America works. In fact, and this is one of the great paradoxes, the freedom to be alone becomes the freedom to join. We don't have to have the government force people together. If you allow people, because people are natural social animals, if you, if you get out of their way, don't raise their taxes, give them enough take-home pay, let them have a chance to go do it, the natural bias of people is to work with each other. And so you see in America, and this was, was the point de Tocqueville drove at hardest, was that he was stunned as a Frenchman at the way in which all of this freedom didn't become sit around, don't do anything, get drunk, and, and be uh, indigent. It became be energetic, be excited, pursue your dreams, have a wonderful life, go do something that's fun. And fun can be becoming a millionaire, fun can be being the best golfer. I mean, fun is how you define it. The pursuit of happiness, which is a very broad statement. Now, it led to an extraordinary explosion of energy and creativity. And yet, joining in citizenship in America have been built on a sense of duty. Again and again for 200 years, uh, you had people saying, of course you're going to be active. Of course you're going to do something. That's what citizenship requires. And you didn't have a sense of dignity if you weren't involved as a civic leader. You wanted to be involved. And if you go back and look at the movies of the 30s and 40s, you see all sorts of examples where people would go out and they would organize a better future and they would do things that were positive and they had a sense of how do we come together in order to improve our collective future.